We are back. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Lens, a leap edition, shall we say, it, because it is leap day today, February 29th. Um, interesting day today after uh, the Oscars, Spirit Awards. Um, a lot of big doings. A lot of people are happy. Leo got his Oscar. Sly did not, much to the chagrin of many, including myself. Um, the show on the whole, uh, there's already a lot of discussion. We've had some discussion here on Behind the Lens uh, about uh, the diversity issue at stake. And I think what uh, more impactful, other than what Chris Rock, his opening monologue was fine. I think he perpetuated it, uh, the whole Black Lives Matter too much. And for that to be the final sign-off tag of the Oscars and go in to fight the power, I think, was just jamming it down the throats of the globe, of the global audience. It was ignoring as Oscar winner Alejandro Inarito pointed out in the press room, it's not just about black lives, it's about all lives. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of diversity out there. And to just hone in on one aspect totally ignores the gender issues of female directors and the absence. I mean, the last female director that was nominated and she won was Catherine Bigelow. Um, we have plenty of fine female directors out there. One of them I had a chance to talk to uh, at the Spirit Awards carpet, uh, Reed Moreno, who uh, herself was nominated. She was cinematographer on her own film, Meadowland. And if you haven't seen it, see it if you can. It is a wonderful film, and it really showcases Reed's talents. But it's so much bigger than the Black Lives Matter. And Inaritu rightly pointed that out in the press room, and I hope that a lot of the journalists in there make that front and center of their stories as opposed to singling out Black Lives Matter. I've always maintained, I currently maintain, and always will, the diversity of a filmmaker and their voice will come through if you make good product. Um, it was evidenced uh, at the Spirit Awards when fabulous Abraham Atta won for not best supporting lead but best male lead for Beast of No Nation uh, either later today or tomorrow uh, we were in the pre- I was in the press tent for the Spirit Awards and uh, had a chance to talk to Abraham about that and heard his awe and wonder when he realized that Idris Elba was in the supporting actor category and Idris won a Spirit Award but Abraham was best male lead um you'll hear the glee in his voice when we get uh and see it on his face when we get that footage up um right now uh, there are a lot of red carpet interviews uh on elias entertainment movie shark de on youtube uh which i think you'll find quite interesting with some of the wonderful talent including i had a chance to talk with at the spirit awards uh charles cohen uh, cohen the ceo of cohen media group and Cohen Media Group, they take risks. Uh, they're like A24 and Open Road who take risks. They find those little gems and they hone them and they care for them and they love them and they mount campaigns. Cohen Media Group brought us one of my all-time favorite films, uh, The Liberator, starring my pal Edgar Ramirez. Um, uh, and they, mar- they launched a very heavy marketing campaign Liberator almost made it, almost made it all the way to win uh, Best Foreign Language Film a few years ago. Sadly, it did not. L- uh, last year, their baby was Timbuktu. This year, Cohen Media Group, Rams was one of their big ones, and Mustang, uh, which it tackles socially relevant issues, which a lot of the, char- a lot of the films that Charles Hand picks, because he's also a producer, and that's what they do. And, uh, you know, All incredible films. Um, Mustang did not pick anything up at the Spirit Awards. But the fact it was nominated, the fact people did take note of the film speaks volumes. Diversity is out there. If the product is there, people will watch it. Um, For those that may be listening, the, the whole sketch routine that Chris Rock did during the Oscars going to an alleged theater in Compton and talking to 
doing a man on the street thing about have you heard of this movie have you seen this movie that one that one segment did more to discredit ver- diversity arguments than anything else i've heard um when you're asking people about titles of films at, well i've never heard of it i've never heard of it bridge of spies i've never heard of it what is that well the bridge of spies as an example mounted a huge huge radio campaign you could not be driving in the car listening to KNX news for 15 minutes without hearing a promo for Bridge of Spies newspaper coverage magazine coverage online coverage is nobody out there getting information from news sources or having any sense of curiosity to see what's going on in the world? The way the Academy is going to resolve the diversity issue, the way these other film festivals and filmmakers are going to resolve it, people have to become aware, they have to be curious, they have to pay attention, and they have to understand and know the world around them. And in, that starts with education. And if you don't have that, you are not going to get diversity. And That brings me to another fun event I did on Friday for a new documentary that's out from Camila Lopez called Equal Means Equal. This addresses the whole gender diversity that we are lacking in film, not just in film, but on many other fronts. During the political campaigns right now, we're hearing people say equal pay, equal pay, equal pay. Well, the world is beyond equal pay. The United States is one of the few countries that still does not have an equal rights amendment for women. 24 simple words. It was passed by Congress in 1972, fell three states short of ratification in the United States. Uh, It still has not been passed by Congress again. There's a big push this year for the Equal Rights Amendment, which would extend into pay, health care, positions within companies. Here you're going to... and equal that then sets a precedence for other diversity factors uh so equal means equal Kamala has done a wonderful job of bringing this film together and under the the web of why it's important for the equal rights amendment to be brought to the forefront again and why it needs to be passed and ratified in the united states come on india india has an equal rights amendment Almost every industrialized country has an equal rights amendment. The United States doesn't. These are the kind of films that are being made to educate the, pop, the, the population, to educate moviegoers, and to open the eyes. It's these kind of films that will help solve the diversity issue. We don't need to have an entire Oscar ceremony preaching that to everybody. I've already heard from viewers and listeners that were very offended by the ceremony. As I said, I'm more offended that Sylvester Stallone did not win, that Lady Gaga and Diane Warren did not win, that Sam Smith is an idiot and touted himself as the first openly gay person to get an Academy Award. Thank you, Dustin Lance Black, for uh, correcting that on Twitter and enlightening him. Um, There's a lot of diversity and a lot of controversy that the Oscars stirs up that, unfortunately, they only glossed over. People need to take uh, take a look at the films that are out there, all of the films that are out there. The voices are there. And again, a lot of this discussion started with Jada Pinkett Smith uh, and her whining, which Chris Rock appropriately brought up, uh, whining because her man did not get an Oscar nomination. Yes, his performance was great for his body of work, but it was not great when you compared it to the other nominees. It's that plain and simple. You want to get nominated, put in the work, as Kevin Hart says. You put it in, you keep working, you push through, and change will happen. So, there's my soapbox for today. Um, But it's an important thing, and it's something that I see all the time, especially with all of the independent films that I deal with and all the independent filmmakers at the festival level. And many of them are facing these similar challenges that have also permeated into film festivals. I know multiple filmmakers approached me last year that they're getting very savvy. And all of you guys submitting to festivals now, you might want to think about this. 
when you're sending in your screening links for consideration, try setting up different links with each festival having a different code number. You will be able to track, or password, you'll be able to track who's actually looking at your film. At one film festival last year, I had multiple filmmakers approach me and tell me that they were rejected at Los Angeles Film Festival, Dances with Films, and two other film festivals, and they were able to track and see that the programmers never even screen their films. This is another layer of the issue. Um, so there are so many layers here. The bottom line is everybody needs to get educated. Everybody needs to pay attention to what's going on in the world around them. They need to listen to Leonardo DiCaprio. They need to watch the documentary that he is now uh, putting together and putting out there on global climate change. There are so many ways for filmmaker voices to be heard, for the public's voices to be heard. If we all just sit up, pay attention. And a film is the most perfect way to do that. But if you make it, the audience will come. The votes will come. The nominations will come. But you've got to make a good product. And you've got to, you've got to, you, you just got to keep trucking and the euphemism from the 60s for those that aren't old enough to remember that. Um, but so we've got, there's a lot that film can do for us. And, you know, to make it work to everybody's best advantage, as Inaritu said, everybody's voices. It's not just Black Lives Matter, it's All Lives Matter. Everybody's matter with film and with everything else. So that is the goal that has to be achieved, not just one specific area. So I know that, that Edwin Ortega is already on the line. Now that I've gotten my Oscar spiel and diversity spiel out of the way here, um, let me tell you a little bit about who we have today on Behind the Lens. Very exciting. Joe Pepitone is back with us, writer-director of one of the funniest films of last year and still this year, The Jersey Devil, where hell gets moved from hell to New Jersey. So Joe is back, but also he's bringing along two of the stars of the film, Edvin Ortega and Penelope, La Penelope Lagos. So this is going to be a really fun and interesting round robin. Um, and... Of course, Penelope, I know already, is going to gush and drool over her joy over Leonardo DiCaprio winning his Oscar last night. So you know what? Um, why don't we take a short break while Edvin and Penelope are on hold, and then we'll be right back, and they'll be with us live. Behind the Lens is sponsored in part by the Culver City Observer. Located in the heart of Screenland, Culver City Observer is available in print and online at www.culvercityobserver.com. And we're back. Welcome back to Behind the Lens. I'm Debbie Lynn Elias, film critic and soapbox preacher at times, and live with me right now some of my most favorite people in the world, one I know is one of, is one of my most favorite people, and the other two I, I, I'm growing to love as every day goes by, Joe Pepitone, Edwin Ortega, and Penelope Lagos. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. So everybody's here? Everyone seems to be here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> now the trouble starts. Uh, well, the, the, the fact that Edwin's on the phone means we already have trouble. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> Your reputation precedes you, young man. I, I I don't know. I think it's a Cuban thing, maybe. I don't know. You think you think so? So I think so. I don't know. <laughs> so you know, before we get into the Jersey Devil, one of my most favorite films. <laughs> um, I know Penelope is very excited over the fact that Leo finally won his Oscar last night. Yeah, very excited. I think it was long overdue. Yeah. Now I want to. And Joe, you as as a writer director, and Edwin, because your hands are in so many different projects, from DJing to music to film to television. What do you guys think of the Oscars last night? Um, 
how the diversity issue was approached and the winners and losers and how Sly Stallone could get snubbed. Well, I'm I'm now protesting because Sly Stallone didn't win. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So that 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 kind of like put a damper on it for me. The whole I, I thought the show was good. I thought Chris Rock did a good job um, addressing it. He had to, but I thought it it was too heavy uh, for the whole evening. The whole show became about the diversity issue and uh, no blacks being nominated. But I thought he he addressed it well. But the fact that it was the the main point of the whole evening, I think, kind of took away from the awards and the accomplishments of. Uh, of everyone there. Yeah, I mean that that I know some people that turned the show off. I know s- many that turned it off after Sly lost. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I was yeah, tempted. I, I think it was really overshadowed um, for what the Oscars is supposed to be and the meaning and platform of the show. I thought when you saw a performance like Lady Gaga's where which I totally agree with you. I know we spoke about this for a second over email, but um I think she she definitely should have won after that performance. But um, I think to use the Oscars as a platform for that type of message to to the public makes more sense than um, the heavy focus on the diversity issue. Mm -hmm. So that's just my opinion. (laughs) No, I'm right there with you, Penelope. I don't know if you guys heard me at the top of the hour, but that's one of the things that I am big on. If you're making the right kind of product, if people are educating themselves, if you have a marketing campaign, they will come and see your film. Your voices will be heard as filmmakers, as actors. You know, and Edvin, coming from Cuba, have you experienced, you know, everything, but he's so focused on Black Lives Matter after last night again. But in a read to uh, backstage, very, very passionate about, no, everybody, everybody, all the voices of filmmaking need to be heard. Have you encountered any kind of obstacles yourself in terms of casting? Since you're doing everything uh, there is, I can't imagine it. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I think, first of all, I, I agree with Penelope and, and Joe about the show in general uh, last night. Um, as, as far as for me, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's always kind of tough, um, I would say, being, you know, it's, it's good and it's bad. It's, it's a blessing and it's a curse. You know, it's. Uh, I remember going out for auditions, and you know, sometimes uh, being too diverse, maybe having too much of an accent, or you know, some kind of a ethnic look that didn't really fit the project. Or sometimes I'm not diverse enough. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes they're looking for somebody that's a little more has more of a very uh, clear, like Latin look. And what a Latin look is is, um, I guess, it's a little bit confusing now everybody kind of you know assumes that it's like hey you know if you're latin then you know you you must be playing uh, a mexican uh, character you know that's and you, your accent must be you know this and you must kind of have this kind of look you've got to be a little darker and i'm not like that i'm latin but I, that's not my look mm-hmm. so for me i think that's been a challenge as far as you know finding where i fit but you know there's also a thing i think that and obviously, I think diversity is great. I mean, I think we need that in everything because that's just real life. But, you know, at the same time, there's just some projects that it's also about just finding the right person, you know, the right uh, talented person that, that fits the job. Yeah, I mean, that that's something that I've talked with many directors over the years about. And, you know, perfect examples. Uh, you know, Sigourney Weaver has taken on a part before that was originally written for a man but she got the script and it's like well you know i think we could switch this up sandra bullock did the same thing this past year with uh, our brand is crisis which george clooney and grant heslov produced and it was like oh yeah well we just didn't think of it so i think a lot of it is if people would like just think outside the box right exactly right you know now and i think also it's kind of like you know when you have a name like when you already have an established name and for whatever whatever reason that person maybe it's been around longer mm-hmm. you know they have a following people like them you know i feel that they're they are most likely to get the parts versus somebody else who's maybe you know just coming in or or doesn't have as much of a, a following mm-hmm. um and that could appear that it could be a diversity thing but i i think it's just that i think sometimes it's also about hey you know we know this person this person is a, mm-hmm. a bigger name the part is going to go to that person and then and whether whether that's fair or not, I mean, you know, that's just an argument to be had. But I think that also uh, plays into it. 
Well, and then I think also both you, Edwin, and you, Penelope, you face, you, you undoubtedly have faced the problem of you just don't have enough experience for the, the role that needs to be tackled. Right. Yeah, and, absolutely. I think when you have different genres and say I've been heavily focused on drama or comedy, then if there's an action role, um, you know, that might go to someone that has, some, has had some martial arts experience or has worked on another action film. And so same thing with dance or, or any of the special skills that a lot of the talented actors have out there. It's, it's really tough to say you didn't get one part or another um, based on skin color. And if we're going to discuss that, then we, you know, we have to talk about um, all, all the minorities. You mm -hmm. know, again, what you were saying before with, with everything matters. And if we focus on more of how we're the same rather than how we're different, maybe the conversation can move forward from there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, this is one, you bring up a good point, too, about special skills. And this is something a lot of people can say what they will about the studio system of days gone by. But I know as a writer, director, and producer, Joe wouldn't be able to pay to send you to dance class, singing class, martial arts class, um, firearms class to get you ready for a part. Whereas, you know, studios provided all those classes for all of their actors so they could be more diverse in their skill set. And there, you know, be put to and be put to work more. Yeah, I am paying for penalty for anything. <laughs> did you even? Did you even give use a few more dance lessons? I don't know what the problem is. Okay, I, but I, now you know. Now that you've said that, you opened. You just you went to hell with that one, Joe. You know, did you even give her a paycheck? Because and because Penelope's worked with you before. Yes. Then yeah, we worked together on um, Stuck in the Middle, which was another comedy um, that actually took place in Purgatory. I call it the first of the, uh, the trilogy that Joe's going to do, although <laughs> he hasn't totally come on board with that. But um, <laughs> the, uh, I guess we did Stuck back in 2011, right, Joe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so so yeah, we, we, we worked on that. We worked on um, Jersey Devil, and, and we're working on another one together, so... Yeah, I, I, I keep hiring her. I, I don't know. Uh, i okay. got to start um, giving her some background. You need to start some... branching out. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> but see, number, Everything is right here. number one, you're that good, Penelope. But number two, that tells me you kind of need to raise your rate a bit. You're very valuable. <laughs> well, that, hey, that's all union. That's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> well, I, I, I think maybe some perks need to be tossed in some, you know. Yeah, well, now that these the conversation has opened up about special skills, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, maybe Joe will be on board for, for a little extra. I got her oatmeal on the last one, so that's, uh, I don't know what else I can do <laughs> at this point. Oh, my God. We were in the middle of the snowstorm. Snow <laughs> we okay. were in the middle of the snowstorm, and I, um, I guess catering didn't show up, right? Well, they didn't have anything you liked, I believe it was. <laughs> no, that's not, exactly, that's not exactly what happened. I don't think catering was there, actually. And so I'm wondering what's happening for breakfast. And um, I said, it would, at least is there a packet of oatmeal, like, laying around somewhere? And uh, there wasn't. So uh, Joe went out with his um, leather jacket, which he called a winter coat. And um, I'm with Joe. he actually went and got me oatmeal. So I do, I do remember that. Well, okay, now hey, you, you did that. If for it's winter and I have a coat on, it's a winter coat. You know that. <laughs> but, you know, that's, exa that's how I am, too, Joe. I used to get yelled at all the time, you know, growing up in, in Philly. I'd go outside, take the trash out barefoot and stuff, and people would think <laughs> I was insane. It's like, I'm only going 25 feet. You know? Yeah, I, that, that's the California mentality. <laughs> you know, but, yeah, coats, I don't own a coat. I don't even own a coat anymore. Nice. I've got leather jackets, and that's it. If I need more than that, forget it. Not, <laughs> exactly. I not agree. happening. So now, you know, you were nice enough. You brought Penelope Oatmeal, but Edvin, what did he do? What did Joe do to entice you and keep you happy on the set? Um, he hired me. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that was pr I was pretty happy with that. Um, but uh, well, no, you know what? It, it was uh, it was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, fun, of course. Um, and we uh, we had a lot of inside jokes, a lot of wrestling jokes, because we're both wrestling fans. So I think that that for me was like very cool to be around. The the actual great thing about Edvin is he was hired. Uh, we we had a person in that part, and we had to let go two days before we started filming. And um, Keith Collins, our lead actor, had worked with Edvin before, and he said, um, 
I got this guy. We're, we're late. We got, we got to come up with something. And my only response to Keith was, is he good? <laughs> and uh, the thing with Edvin, he had to be there every day. He had no breaks. He had to learn the script. And after shooting a 10, 12-hour day, he had to go back to his room and learn the next day's script. So he did a, he did an amazing job. And the fact that he was a wrestling fan, too, we, we just hit it off. And it just it worked great. So that that was a great job by him learning everything and, and putting it together in a couple of days. Well, you know, now now that you brought that up, Joe, you know, Edvin, this is the special skill you need to have on your resume. I can learn a part in less than 24 hours, so hire me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know I if you want to do that again. That <laughs> well, yeah, it was a little bit. Uh, I, you know, to be honest, I don't know how I, how I got through it. I have no idea. It just kind of happened. It was magic. It worked out. Um, I think... Yeah, I think part of it was just, you know, honestly, the writing and the whole script just made, just made a lot of sense from the from the from the moment I read it. So I just kind of knew, had a really really good vibe about it, a really really good feeling for it. So some parts that maybe I, I wasn't, uh, you know, exactly 100 percent memorized, um, still made sense. So we were able to to work with it and, and you know, make those performances come come out. Now, Edwin, because you came in at the last minute and because you had worked with Keith before and you were Keith's, you're the right-hand man to the heir apparent devil, for goodness sake. Did that help you, and did that help you with um, performance and with dynamic and, you know, finding that rhythm on set? Yeah, absolutely. It was funny because I, I worked with Keith before in a totally complete, um, you know, project, of, you know, totally 100% different. But uh, and we we had hit it off and we were cool, but we never really spent uh, that much time together. And then we kind of reunited for this, and it was just like I don't know. It was just it was just a, a perfect fit. You know, I was I was sort of like the little sidekick. He was uh, you know the devil, and obviously I'm I'm his his go-to guy, his devil's advocate. And it, it just kind of seemed like that was the way it kind of worked in real life. So I think it just made sense as well. Well, you know, something that Joe and I talked about before is. You've got this great blend of veterans like Chris Mulkey, Jack Mulcahy, David Chokichi, and you know, exper- and you know, different levels of experience. How important is that for all of you when you're doing a film, so that you have veterans that you can feed off of, learn from, and as you know, the the younger newcomers, you can infuse an energy that sometimes the veterans tend to lose unless they have younger performers around them. Does Speaking for myself, I, I think that it raises the game. I mean, just to be around people that have been in the industry for so long and they're so talented, um, it just makes you want to be better. And, and I remember when Chris came in, um, you know, the, during the snowstorm, and, and it was, um, I guess he had flown in from L.A., and, and he really was just down to business with us and and really there was one particular scene that we were shooting that he's in at the at the very end when when pretty much all the characters are there Mm -hmm. and there was a point where um he gets knocked down you know knocks edvin down Mm -hmm. and i'm supposed to go to the floor and see if he's okay and everything and and my timing was off with it and and he actually gave me a note about it while we were shooting the scene he kind of, like, did a little whistle for me to look over. I'm like, okay, that makes sense with the timing. I should have been looking up at that moment. And so just having that, you know, being around somebody like that, that's, that's been in the industry and that's been on so many, you know, indie films as well as big budget films um, was just a blessing for us to be around. Mm-hmm. So I was really excited about that. And how- I didn't know he did that. I, w- I was not informed of this. <laughs> well, Joe, you don't have to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's that's what I was just going to say, Joe. How how does this help? You know, how does this benefit you as the director when you do get guys who are that generous and experienced like Chris, who do well, these well, little things? Great. I know, knew coming in, you know, he's been doing this thirty years or so. I, yeah. I was a little, you get a little intimidated. Like, is this guy going to come in and see and just try to take over or just just pick on things you're doing? But Chris was so great, just going over things with me and just telling me, hey, we should do this, we should go this way, what do you think in here? So he was a huge help. Anybody who has that kind of experience, I'm going to listen to. And, and he was so forthcoming with everybody, including me on that. So Chris, Chris was a pleasure and a help on, on the set. Okay, Edvin, so how much help is it to you when you get experienced veteran actors to work with you? 
or don't they want to? <laughs> no, it, it's absolutely great. I mean, uh, like like he said, you know, anytime you get somebody like that that's been doing it for so long and so many projects. I mean, just the way they. One thing I noticed that struck me right away. Um, you know, we both uh, Chris and uh, and David coming up coming on. Just the minute they got on, it was just like you could see there was a change. You know, they were just ready to, to like we say, bring it. Mm-hmm. You know, they were ready. They were there. They were excited about it, um, and had a lot of feedback. You know, they they've been you know doing this a lot and had a bunch of po- uh, projects. You know, that they could take from and add to this. Uh, for me, it was, it was a little bit intimidating. I'm not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> You know, especially being the shorter out of everybody there, I'm, I'm always kind of looking up at everybody. Uh, You're the Cuban head. That intimidated me a little bit too. It's kind of like, oh, hey, uh, you really are God. I'm like looking up at you right now. Well, you know, um, you're just the Cuban Kevin it, Hart. That's all you got to tell people. You're the Cuban Kevin Hart. He's not as short as Kevin Hart. I can't yeah, exactly. No. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm not as short as Kevin Hart. No, I like to say I'm a strong five seven. That's all I say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But no, it was it, it was a little bit intimidating. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's sort of you get intimidated at the very first minute, and then it's like, wow, we're really you know we're rolling here. You get just such a heightened performance uh, when you have you know people like that in different elements. Like you said, you know, some some younger people um, with some very experienced uh, veterans coming in. You know, that mix is just very I think electric. You know, just kind of provides um, a couple of couple of options there that, you know, maybe you wouldn't have if everybody was, you know, all newcomers or all sort of veterans. Just a nice energy, a nice blend that mm-hmm. happens. Well, and, you know, Joe, when you're writing, because you've worked with Keith Collins before, you've worked with Penelope before, when you're writing a script like this, be it Stuck in the Middle, be it The Jersey Devil, do you have these people in mind when you're writing? And now that, you know, now that you've worked with Edvin, would you you know, think about writing a part with him in mind for for future films. Yes, definitely. Definitely working on Jersey Devil, having come, having worked with Penelope and, and Jack McKay and Keith, I, I had the parts for them. I knew exactly who they were going to be, and I knew how I wanted them to uh, play these parts, because I had seen them before, I knew their strengths, so that was easy. And definitely for Edvin, anything I do in the future, I know what Edvin can do or what I would want to try to stretch uh, stretch what he can do, and same with Penelope. Just uh, write them parts and say, "I know you guys can do this. Go, go out and and kill it." So yeah, I love. It made Jersey Devil a little bit easier than Stuck in the Middle because I had voices that I could write to. Mm. So I got to ask you, Penelope, did you like shooting Jersey Devil better than Stuck in the Middle, or vice versa? And how did Joe grow as a director between the two? Oh. Objection. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no objection. <laughs> Just co- um, cover your ears, Joe. I, um, <laughs> I actually preferred the Jersey Devil, and I feel like there's a few reasons for that. Um, there were, I felt like the bud, the actual production itself um, was larger and more professional than we had for Stuck in the Middle. We um, definitely learned acting-wise as well as production-wise some mistakes that we had made on the first film, and I think those were ironed out for the Jersey Devil. So mm-hmm. um, it was nice to come on set and, and just sort of see um, how things had changed in, in a positive way. Um, and just working with these actors this time, I mean, we had a, a bigger cast and a lot of different types types of characters. And um, I just really think that it was a more... I, I enjoyed both films, but I, I found this to be more an enjoyable film for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it also taxed, I think, my range a little bit more as far as the character was concerned, whereas in Stuck in the Middle of Brooklyn, which was a character that I played, um, was more of your girl-next-door type, which I, I've played um, many times. But I think uh, this particular character was one I hadn't played before, and, and so that was challenging and, and fun for me as well. Um, as for Joe, I think, again, um, he learned a lot, you know, um, going through stuck and and seeing the ins and outs of, of working uh, with the crew members, working with the actors, and, and what's always great about working with Joe, um, and I'm not saying this just because he's on the phone, um, he knows I feel this way, I, I feel like he allows us as actors to 
actually have a dialogue with him. And I know I've met directors in the past who it's sort of their way or the highway, and there's no conversation about how the script is going to go or, or how, you know, what our take on the script is. And with, with Joe, you can really work with him and just bounce ideas off each other, and he gives you a little leeway of what you decide to do in, in the scene. Um, and so having that sort of flexibility with a director mm -hmm. and being comfortable enough to talk to them about what they, in this case, wrote. I mean, these are his words, and, and you want to do them justice, and you want to be able to have them come to life as he envisioned it when he was writing it. Mm -hmm. And so to, to be a part of that process, um, I think Joe knows us as actors a little bit more now than he did in the past, and so he's able to write for us and, and really allow us to, to do what we love to do, which is which is acting. Mm. Well, you know, and now, Edvin, you really have a very eclectic resume of jumping with, you know, with films, with TV, and you work with a lot of different directors. You know, how, where does Joe fit in and doing a project like Jersey Devil? Well, um, Joe is sort of, my, my first impression of Joe was like, first I was a little bit, scared, like, oh, man, this guy's wearing the leather jacket. I don't know. He seems like a little bit of a rock and roll guy slash wrestler guy. I, I might get, you know, this might be dangerous here. Uh, but my first impression of Joe was just, he just, you know, was very to the point. Um, he, like Penelope said, actually, the, the one thing that, for me, sort of made the whole thing easier, especially coming on to the project uh, later, was just what you said, that, you know, he lets you you know, do your thing. Obviously, he's got a script that he wrote um, and, and I, you know, an idea of what we want to do with the production and the direction. But, I mean, I think Joe's a fan of actors and of performances. Mm. So I don't think he, he, you know, he sort of does his way to sort of make, does his best to try to just let you uh, be you. I mean, I, I feel like that was sort of the, the ongoing theme for, for most of the, the film, at least for my part, which is kind of like, I just went to, to him saying, hey, was this okay? Was this okay? Is this what you wanted? And it was just like, yeah, no, that was right on. And it was just very positive. Um, for me in the past, this is really one of the, the only comedy roles that I've done. So, and yeah. I've, I've always been very, very fearful of, of comedy. Because comedy is, is tough, you know. People say drama, but comedy is really, really tough because of the timing and, and everything like that. Uh, so for me, being able to have that freedom... Um, where I can kind of play and really, you know, go through this and, and see what works uh, for myself. And the, and the process was, you know, a bit of a blessing. Um, as far as how he compares with other people I've worked with, I mean, you know, he's he's obviously awesome and very talented, and I'm not saying that because he's on the phone. <laughs> um, but uh, he's just, you know, he's just a real guy. I think Joe's a real guy who's a, a fan of good writing, good projects, actors, and I think he's, he's just somebody that you can talk to, and that is that is very uh, tough to find in, in, the, in the business, you know. So usually actors are, you know, sometimes you don't really get to chat with somebody about a project or, or really, you know, hang out and kind of kind of see what's on their mind about it. And I think when you have that kind of relationship, it just makes working together, you know, so much better, such a breeze. Now, you know, I hope you, you, you both know that I just set you up so that you could really laud and glorify Joe, so now he has to hire you for all his future films. <laughs> I love it. And let me mention, well, That's what too, I figured, wife, you know? <laughs> no, I have to mention, too, his wife, Christine, who's wonderful, she actually makes a mean banana bread, so I like to come to set for that, too. <laughs> okay. that's, that's the only reason they want to work with me. <laughs> that's the only reason they come in, yeah. Well, the pastries. Well, if Christine makes a mean banana bread... Why did you bring Penelope oatmeal and not banana bread on set? <laughs> well, it was only available certain times, certain days. Well, excuse I us. Will, uh, because my wife was mad at me because she was shoveling the 20 inches of snow while I was filming a movie, so she wasn't going to bake. <laughs> Maybe you should buy her a snowblower. <laughs> yes, thank you. There you go. We've had this conversation, <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's been many fights about that. <laughs> Trust me. We're I, Team Christine on this one. <laughs> hey, I, I listened to all those many fights in my own house, you know, where my dad was out shoveling the snow. And it's like, well, what's taking you so long? And he'd go, I'm using a shovel. Buy me a snowblower. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, based, I'm listening to what Edwin and Penelope are saying, and 
you know, and listening to what they're saying and what I see on screen, Joe, I think it's very true. You are an actor's director. Would you consider yourself to be that? Yeah, what Ed been said is, is totally right. I love acting. I love just sitting there as director and watching them perform. It's cool to see the words you've written brought, brought, brought out by great actors, and I just I have so much fun watching them perform this stuff, and they're so good at it. So I definitely would have said it's true. I, I just like performances. I like seeing this stuff come to life with, with, with all these great actors we had. So that's definitely true. I just let them do the thing. They know more about acting than I do. I can tell them what I was thinking when I wrote this, what I want, but they know what to, they know what to do, and they know how to bring it alive. So definitely can sit back and, and watch that. I'm definitely a fan. Yeah. Now, I have to ask you, Joe, considering it's stuck in the middle, purgatory, the Jersey Devil. What is this fascination with with living in New Jersey and the Jersey, you know, the tri-state area and writing films about hell? <laughs> says a lot about me, right? <laughs> well, no, it says a lot about where you and I both come from. So <laughs> <laughs> you write what you know, right? <laughs> I think I think the best thing what, what was easy, especially doing Stuck in the Middle is that I didn't have any boundaries writing purgatory. You, no one knows what it is. No one knows what hell is, if it exists, what it's like. So I have no guidelines at all. I can write anything, and if anybody says, how could that happen? Well, you tell me if it's right or wrong. <laughs> That's the way it is. So <laughs> I like writing with no rules and no boundaries, and I can make up the universe. Now, do each of you have a favorite scene within Jersey Devil? Mm-hmm. There are many. Have, there well, are many good ones in there. I, I have. I have one. If I can jump in first, it's def, It's the yeah. scene. The only dramatic scene in the in the thing is between Penelope and Edvin. It's when uh, Edvin is trying to practice his pitch on how he's going to steal some souls, and he's he's doing it to Penelope. And that's the moment where they connect and have their kiss. And there's there's just a great dialogue that uh, Penelope talks about true love. I'm a sap for something like that, and it was my my one romantic scene in the whole movie so that's my favorite and i love the way they pulled it off that was that, and i i gotta agree with you that's a it's a beautiful scene that the two of you did there how much we re- how much Thanks rehearsal much. with the kiss how much rehearsal did you get come on well, you know a couple of days a couple of hours um, a couple of months planning it so um you know, it's funny because um, I think you either have chemistry with another actor or you don't. It's kind of something that you can't work on, at least not for me. So with Edvin, you know, I hadn't met him prior when we had the table read. Like we've said, he came in late in the game. So um, I was a little concerned about whether or not I would have chemistry with him and whether we would be able to make this believable. And um, just from the moment that we met, first day of production, um, we just had an, an instant connection, and, and um, he's just super easy to get along with. And, and I think that, um, you know, when you have a scene like that, you know, people think it's – people always ask about these type of scenes, you know, how do you feel when they're happening and, and what's it like. And it's like, well, there's always so many people around you, and there's a camera in your face, and you just try to, you know, block that stuff out and, and make the scene as real as, as it can be. So um, I think – working with Edvin and, and him being so talented and I just it was just easy for me to um, to make the connection and um, if you follow the story to really see how she does fall for him so yeah I don't know if Joe realizes that he really did work you really did work in a love story in here my, my goal is to one day just write in uh, just a straight out sappy romantic comedy that's my goal one day <laughs> That would be. Uh, I would pay to see it. Which, that's would, right. Me and Penelope will play those parts. That's fine. <laughs> We're in. So now, now for you, Edvin and Penelope, what would do you have a favorite scene within the film? Yeah, I mean, there were so many. I mean, I, I, I absolutely love that scene. I think, um, like Penelope said, I think we just had great chemistry. So every scene that were in together was really fun and you know enjoyable. Um, I actually really like. Um, there's a couple. Couple other two scenes that I really really love. One is when we are showing uh, Keith, uh, the devil, devil to be, <laughs> what places we were suggesting the new hell would be located, um, and we we're showing him on a on a video screen, and a couple of skits that are happening, and I thought that was really fun. And Penelope's wearing this blue dress, which was lovely, 
Uh, I mean, I like that. It was part. really good. So, you know, that helps that scene. Uh, but I thought it was really just funny, and that was fun. Um, and then my other favorite scene, I think, was we're not even in it. It was actually the scene with Keith. It was mm-hmm. an action scene where he uh, chokes out uh, somebody's uh, husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was that thought that was just hilarious and, and fun. Yeah, I the boardroom scene for me is one of my favorites. Um just because the the day player actors that were brought in that day to do the boardroom scene, they have so many hilarious one liners mm-hmm. and everyone just came together and I thought the scene turned out really great and it's just really funny. Um I also like the easy pass scene, which we're not in, but um Stephen Fontana, um <laughs> The actor who plays Judas, he has a really, really funny scene when they're uh, they're waiting uh, in traffic. Uh, yep. In the easy path, I think you remember. You probably remember that scene. But um, he has a lot of uh, nonverbal throughout the movie. There's a lot of nonverbal um, communication that goes on with him um, that is really, really funny if you watch him closely during the movie. Mm-hmm. Now, I bet you're right. The easy pass scene is very funny, especially if people understand how that easy pass system works back east exactly (laughs) you know that that's one of the great things about this film with all of you is because it really does joe really incorporates so much of the local culture of the tri-state area with the jokes and with you know and with the setting and the whole idea and you and i talked about this before joe about moving hell to new jersey you know, the reputation is there. It's been there for decades. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, it's just, I just think this is just such a fun film, which leads me to ask, so why didn't this get an Oscar nomination? <laughs> oh, racism, obviously. Oh. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think it was a diversity thing for sure. <laughs> diversity. Prejudicial against... It was my fault, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, no Cubans next time. That's I right. thought it was maybe New Jersey. Boycotting New Jersey. <laughs> You know, it's that's a possibility. See, no, that's a distinct possibility. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real possibility. So now I know, Edvin, you have a big project coming up here, don't you? Something that's yes, I do. Some, I do something that's larger than life. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good way to describe it for sure. Tell yeah, well, actually, uh, Joe's uh, actually working on that with me. Um. Uh, it's uh, it's sort of a documentary, mockumentary type of film uh, about a, a boy band, a boy band who uh, was once, you know, almost there making it, was kind of joined the the ranks of the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and all that, and sort of the rug got pulled out from under them, and you know, the music industry kind of just forgot about boy band, and now, uh, you know, it's 20, 2016 and now they get their uh, their second chance, and you know, can they make it happen? Can they get can they get the uh, the band back together, mm-hmm. and can they uh, can they be in shape enough to make this happen? Uh oh, <laughs> uh oh. Am I am Are I detecting? I'm wondering. You know what? Has everybody been eating boxes of tasty cakes? That we've got a question <laughs> if you're in shape. Well, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, I am Latin, so I do like to eat. <laughs> um, so you know, there's always a little bit of that. <laughs> So now, is this all singing, all dancing? So, so it's actually based on a on a real show that we do. Um, actually, have a a show a group called uh, Larger Than Life, mm-hmm. same uh, same as the movie. The movie the movie's called uh, Larger Than Life: A Boy Band Story, uh, and we actually perform. We do a tribute uh, night, uh, like a '90s tribute band uh, band in uh, in Long Island, New York, mm-hmm. and we also do tri- tri-state area. And we're we're actually recording uh, new music now, original music. So that's going to be a big part of the film, and all that music is going to be in the film. Mm-hmm. Now, are you doing Kickstarter, Indiegogo? How how are you getting this made, or is Joe just ponying up all the money that he's made on Jersey Devil? <laughs> Joe is putting a couple million into it. <laughs> Clearly, don't tell my wife. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> Really, I'm not even in it. We're casting all the uh, the Backstreet Boys. They're just going to play that part. <laughs> that <day>. oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we um, we we definitely have an Indiegogo uh, campaign uh, going on, and you know that's something a little bit new uh, to me that 
you know, uh, just started using some kind of navigating my way through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, we are we are, we are talking to to a few people about you know uh, getting them involved as far as investing and production and all that good stuff. So, where can people go to contribute to your Indiegogo campaign? Do you know, or do I have to go Absol- look this up? Absolutely, <laughs> they can just go right to the uh, Indiegogo dot com and type in uh, "larger than life." And it'll come right in. Uh, the uh, actual the actual campaign is uh, a large, larger than life, a boy band story, um, and the uh, the web address is Indiegogo dot com. The larger than life movie. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Well, you are larger than life with everything that you're doing. You know. Thank you very much. I would truly have to say, you know, from your one-offs, you know, an orange is a new black to a gifted man, you know, to Jersey Devil. Come on, you're always, you're always out there. You're one of the movers and shakers of the new generation, Edvin. Wow, thank you. I'm gonna go home, and my uh, my head is gonna be so gassed up right now, so blown up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You know, well, if if you sucked, I would actually tell you. But you know, <laughs> that's what, as as Joe will tell you, that's what happens when you come from from New Jersey and Philly and this area. You know, you call them like you see them. That's yeah, I've been told like that a lot. <laughs> you know, so so what do you have coming up, Penelope? Other well, than this I've new been doing project. A lot of- um, modeling stuff recently. Mm-hmm. So um, I just actually shot a, a shoe campaign for a new uh, private label line that came up called Click. It's K L I K. It's their spring summer campaign. So um, I actually just shot for them. So I'm excited to see how the line does, and they'll be rolling out actually in the next couple weeks. Um, so that's been good. Um, I also work with a improv group um, called Effective Arts, and um, we recently had a show. I, I work with them every probably a couple times a year, mm-hmm. but um, it's a show that um, they're, they're all over the country. Um, we particularly, the one that I work with is in New Jersey because that's where I actually live. Um, but the show is um, bringing and promoting um, and bringing awareness to organ donation. So what we do is we, as a group, um, we set up simulations based on real-life family situations that have happened. Um, So it's pretty heavy material, um, but since the inception of the group and since we've been going around um, doing the shows, we actually, uh, they've had quite a huge success rate with um, getting families to donate, um, as well as a success rate with having them um, internally the employees of doing better with job performance Mm -hmm. so most of the shows are targeted to people in the profession so whether it be doctors or nurses um, or staff that works for uh, the share network which is the organ procurement uh, establishment in new jersey Um, there is one that they do in manhattan and like i said they're they kind of travel all over the country so they have their base group of actors that they work with in each state so it's a really cool um kind of different Thing that I do because it's not scripted material, it's mm-hmm. improv, and it's a serious subject matter. So, um, a lot different than uh, the Jersey Devil, that's for sure. Well, it gives, <laughs> I think it gives you a balance, though, so that you can hone, you know, you can tap into your dramatic side and your comedic side. Exactly. No, it's, it's really great, and, and I'm all about, um, you know, doing things that make a difference. So, I kind of, uh, it, it was a good fit for me. Now, is there a website people can go to to check this out? to find out when it um, might be in their areas? Well, it's actually not open to the public because it's okay. only people in the industry. So, um... That's fair. That's fair. But Snobs. S- oh, <laughs> snob. Oh, no. It, it's, I've known people that have benefited from organ transplant, and I've seen firsthand what their families go through. So, I mean, this is absolutely fabulous. Absolutely fabulous, and the fact that it is for people for people within that in the industry, I think, is a benefit. So they do know how the family deals with things and how they should be reacting and handling them. In addition to the patient themselves, so no, that's fabulous, Penelope. I love that. Penelope actually does a lot of charity work for a lot of different organizations. She's actually one of the good people. Unlike you, Joe. <laughs> exactly. I don't know why she's working with me. 
So yeah. now, what do you? So you know, what do you have coming up? Well, we got the we got the big one, the one we've been uh, waiting to do for a few years. It's called Phoenix: The Resurrection, mm-hmm. and uh, we've had this. My brother wrote this script uh, a few years back, and we've just been. It's, it's a bigger action drama film, so we've just been waiting for the right money, the right people. We've had a couple attempts where it just it wasn't right, and now I think we we're we're going to have the money. We're going to have the team. A lot of people from Jersey Devil coming back on board, and. Uh, and Penelope and, and Edvin will be a part of that, and uh, we're hoping to shoot. Uh, I'm I'm reluctant to shoot in the summer. I think maybe fall at this point, but we'll see uh, how quickly we turn around. We've just uh, pretty much started pre-production. And where would you be shooting? New York, New Jersey? Uh, most likely Jersey City, mm-hmm. uh, or probably around the same areas we shot. Uh, Jersey Devil. We had a we got a great relationship with the uh, with the city there, and uh, they're uh, welcoming us again. And fall, I think. Knowing the weather back there, I think fall would probably, your humidity level will have decreased sufficiently. Yeah, well, I'm not allowed to shoot in February anymore. <laughs> no. Nobody will work with <laughs> and you. And I think the summer will be a little rough. And then the movie takes place around uh, New Year's and Christmas, so I'd, I want to get as close to that as possible without uh, worrying about weather. Yeah, and you can fake, you can fake Christmas, New Year's yeah. in the fall back east. That's easy enough. The leaves have already turned. It's just, you know, no snow has fallen yet. Or you could make some. Yeah, yeah, we're we're, uh, we're going to do this one up big, and it's really going to be this one's going to decide what uh, what happens after this. We're hoping it turns out well, and we can uh, we can call our own shots after that. So I know people can can watch the Jersey Devil. Where can they find it? Uh, I don't know if last time we talked uh, this had happened, but we are now available on Amazon Video for download to rent or buy, which is uh, really great and has been a really been a good shot in the arm for us. Uh, they can also get the DVD on Amazon or Best Buy, Barnes & Nobles, FYE. Uh, it's out there. It's all over the place. So if you find Jersey Devil, um, we're available. And uh, we've been getting great reviews. Uh, some critics have said some great things, so we're real happy with it. And do we have an official website for the movie? We've been doing everything through uh, Facebook. the Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, so it would be the Jersey Devil movie page. Mm-hmm. And that's where all the all the updates and, and everything about the film can be found. I'm just double checking. You know me, and and thank you. That, you're, that, you're good. And that little you are good. and that little Chiron and all the all the end credits on the video. You know that have all the social media stuff. So, guys, guys, I can't thank all of you enough for for joining me today. This has been so much fun. I just I just adore I adore all of you, and I love this film, and I can't wait to see how Joe tortures. Penelope and Edvin in the next film. <laughs> oh, this, they're going to be tortured, all right. A couple of them might, might, might not make it out. I'm not going to say who yet. Oh, but, boy. Uh, yeah, and now it is an action drama. Therefore, you know, I hope you're paying for them to acquire special skills. Uh, let's see. No, Pen- Penelope's job is just to cry in this film. Oh. So if she, if she can work on that. <laughs> <laughs> and Edvin, I would just say just uh, don't, uh, don't worry about a sequel for you. Uh. Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh. Guys, thank you so, so much, and you all have to come back on the show again. Thank you so much. You're not going to come. You're not going to come back on the show, Edvin. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Jeez, it's, it's done. <laughs> oh, all right, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to thank, say thank you so much. You've been a great supporter to oh. the Jersey Devil, and we really appreciate it. Thank you again. Always, Joe. I'll keep. I will keep supporting. Don't worry <laughs> about it. Thanks, guys. And we're at the end of the show. I know, it's hard to believe, but we are now at the end of the show. We'll be back next week. Uh, Molly Elfman will be joining us and uh, a couple other directors. So, until then, this is Behind the Lens. I'm Debbie Lynn Elias, MovieSharkDeBlore.com. We'll see you then.